Good morning, Warriors Corner. Welcome to day two, our first presentation, Operationalizing Training 2030 with presenters Brigadier General Charles Lombardo, Brigadier General Thomas Felty, Brigadier General David Gardner, Brigadier General Joseph Hilbert, Brigadier General Curtis Taylor, Colonel St Scott Woodward, and Mr. Rich Creed. Hey, good morning. Thank you very much. What a great day and what a great topic to start uh, today. Um, we basically, I'm Chuck Lombardo from the, the director of training for the Army. Um, we've got the entire training ecosystem here represented. So uh, from the department, I'll kind of lead off and then hand it off to our doctrine experts, uh, Rich Creed and our, our three, three great CTC commanders. Um, Tom Felty's in there. He's going to lay out with the Institutional Army and then uh, close out with Scott Woodward at the Combined Arms Center training. So really appreciate you being here. Uh, I'll just lead off with, you know, the, the thing that we're looking at the department, how, how have we trained in the past, where we're going now. Uh, it really starts with our rearm, re our model. It's a regionally armed modernization model. It's really, it's centered around protecting those modernization phases and the windows and really building the army of the future. So it's really building that future readiness. Um, and, you, and the chief has talked and the secretary has talked, we're, we're always going to have to balance readiness, personnel, in modernization, no different today, and we've got some great, uh, you know, capabilities that will enable us to do that. The, the, the second big part, though, it's, and it'll probably come out through all these themes, is it's a culture of ownership. And, and as we've kind of returned back to, to LISCO in, in about 2016, it's, it's the ownership and the training management and, and those core competencies that our Army leaders are going to have to do. We're teaching it at the institution. We're practicing it at home station, and we're validating it at the combat training centers. And, and then, the, you know, the third and final thing before I hand it off uh, to our team is, the, you know, the, the principles of training that Scott will talk about. But one of the big themes is, you know, the fight to train and train at levels that you can sustain. And, and we have to continue to do this in a multi-echelon training. We, we know that we have, uh, the chief has kind of laid out the foundational aspects of our training strategy the department's gonna to continue to fund that T1, T2 strategy, but we know you're gonna to have to have multi-echelon, it's gonna to have to be distributed. We're gonna, every round fired is gonna to have to shoot, train as many echelons as possible. And so, without further ado, I'd like to hand it off uh, to the rest of our teammates here, and they're gonna kinda of explain how they're getting after that in that vein. Rich Creed, over to you, sir. Thank you, sir. So good morning, my name is Rich Crate. I run the Combined Arms Doctor and Director at, uh, at uh, Combined Arms Center at Fort Leavenworth. And we now have a book, right, FM30, it caps uh, our capstone uh, operations doctrine that makes MDO, multi-domain operations, uh, the Army's approach to how it conducts operations across the competition continuum. All right, so when we talk about training, what we're talking about is training to do what? And so you see the description there in the orange box at the top, what multi-domain domain operations are, and I call our attention to a couple things. One, a combined arms approach, right? And so we communicate our culture to the next generation. It's not something that's automatically inherited. So what is combined arms in the 21st century? And to what degree does that mean, including uh, the understanding and those repetitions necessary to employ those joint capabilities, right? And then we do it across three contexts. Uh, and that requires a certain amount uh, of education and training as well to understand the purpose of the operations we conduct during competition below the threshold of armed conflict, during crisis like in Eastern Europe now, uh, or in, uh, uh, during a conflict. And so you see the organization of the book on the left, and then our model of the operational environment. And the thing about that operational environment is it's got three dimensions, they're interdynamic, uh, and, and there's something that's got to be understood. Uh, that human, physical, and information piece. Tenets get to the qualities of the operations we want to conduct. Imperatives, which is really where training needs to focus, are those things that we must be able to do if we want to win acceptable cost. So with that, I'll be followed uh, by the Armor Commandant. Thanks, Rich. And uh, team, my name is uh, Brigadier General Tom Felty. I'm the 53rd Chief of Armor and the uh, Armor Commandant at the Maneuver Center of Excellence. So um, I might get a little excited about this because, uh, you know, at the Maneuver Center of Excellence, a center of gravity for all things maneuver, we get excited about, uh, about training our infantrymen, our armor, and our cavalrymen. So as Rich kind of laid in, and the theme of this whole session here is, our, is, is Army 2030, and Rich laid out uh, our FM 3.0. And so 
Of course, there's going to be a cascading effect across all of the institutions as we now have to begin operationalizing you know, this, new, this new doctrine. And so Armor 2030, if you look at kind of this model that we have here, you ask like, so what is Armor 2030? Well, you look at, we have new doctrine, as Rich just laid out. We have an ever-changing operational environment, right? Everyone can see it. You're reading the news. You see things are changing. Some of the character of war is a little different than now than it was, and it's continuing to change. We have new modernization. We have new equipment that is, that is getting, you know, flowed and flooded into our uh, into our forces. You know, uh, and then and then lastly, I think from the Armor Corps, we have a little bit of a lethality gap in the amount of time we've spent conducting uh, counterinsurgency operations and time off of our platform. So, with those four reasons, this drove our model of of a new Armor uh, 2030 and how we're going to approach uh, how we're going to approach training. So, this is really a, a, a bold step forward uh, for our armored and cavalry forces. In, in a lot of ways, you can see on the right, you can see our training, and on the left, you see the leader development aspects. Uh, and in the center, we have this framework of standardization. And that is really foundational to everything we're doing. And the armor community is going to take a page out of the aviation's handbook, and we're going to model what aviation does in order to build crew readiness across our fleets. And so it's going to be the same standard everywhere you go. And you got to think our master gunners now are going to turn into instructor pilots and standardization officers. And we are going to administer, you know, these precise standards across the board. And I have another slide that I'll talk just a little bit uh, about that. Another aspect of the training, as we're getting ready to have new equipment, as we look forward to the OMFE, is we have a new MOS that was just announced in April. It's called the 19 Charlie. And that MOS is a professionally Brad, a professional Bradley crewman, you know, that'll be in the, in the, in the turrets of all of our mech infantry platoons, you know, and again, it's time for a professional. We're going to see an increase in our uh, competency, and you also will see a decrease in some of the tactical uh, or some of the accidental risks that you, know, you might see out in your, uh, in your, in your formation. Um, and, and a lot of this, too, when you, when you, with this model and this standardization and framework is, is that, we, again, we don't want to start from zero, and we're going to capture everyone's training in a digital job book. Right, that way we can transfer readiness from the institution and we can transfer readiness from the operational one operational unit to the next operational unit. And that's a key, uh, a key aspect of how we're, going to, uh, how we're going to do things. We've also learned that our doctrine and our process is good. Right? It all works, but we just need a little bit more rigor and a little bit more standardization in our approach. Slide, please. And then the last, just this gives you an idea of, uh, of the RL progression model. Of course, we don't want to follow the aviation too closely, so we call it the Standardized Armor Base of Training, SABO, which for all you folks that aren't tankers, that's the name of the, uh, the round that, uh, that, that we use. But you can see on the bottom, we have uh, something called a platform activity category. And so uh, this means if you are an armored crewman, you have a lifelong obligation to stay proficient in your task. If you're in pack one, you know, you, you're, uh, you can see up there, it's, you know, you have, you've got to run through all of your different RL progressions. Uh, pack two, it's a little bit less, and then you get to uh, pack three, it's, it's kind of like an annual exam, and those are for who is outside of, the, uh, outside of the formation. But the other aspect of it, too, is it's shoot, move, communicate, and maintain, because we think, you know, we need to be absolute certified experts in all of these categories as we, uh, as we move through. The other thing that we're exploring in three corps volunteered to do a pilot of our, uh, of our training beginning in calendar year 23 is the idea of certifying by position. So certify our commanders and certify our gunners so that they are interchangeable across all different crews and across our uh, formations. And so I'm going to uh, pass it over to uh, Kurt Taylor. Thank you. Hey, good morning. Uh, my name's Kurt Taylor, and I have the incredible privilege of commanding the National Training Center uh, out of Fort Irwin, California. So the NTC was created 41 years ago in the shadow of the Yom Kippur War for one purpose, and that was to train our combat formations to win the first fight, the first battle of the next war. And we were coming out of a period of profound change in the character of war as the creation of anti-tank guided missiles profoundly changed the way we fought we were moving out of active defense and air land battle. As we look at where we are in history today, we see many parallels to where we were in 1941. Since that was the event that led to the creation of the NTC, we've got to think about how does the NTC change now in light of the evolving character war that we're seeing at the, or in uh, Ukraine and in Nagorno-Karabakh. So the National Training Center is moving in four simultaneous lines of effort to adapt 
the way we fight and the experience we provide to tactical units uh, in light of the publication of multi-domain operations and in light of the changing character of warfare that we're seeing in theater. First and most important, if you saw FM30, which came out yesterday, uh, it talks about one of the imperatives is we must operate in an environment of pervasive surveillance. We must operate with the understanding that all our activities will be observed at all times. We are bringing that to life, that transparent battlefield, to life at the National Training Center. So we created a cell in the Op 4 uh, that, uh, that is focused on the relentless pursuit of information advantage using low Earth orbit satellites. And right here uh, in the lower left, you see a picture of commercial synthetic aperture radar low Earth orbit satellite purchased for a few hundred dollars of a live photo taken at the National Training Center showing defensive preparations. We can get that from commercial sources now with a latency of less than 18 hours. We're also uh, widely expanding the use of drones. We recently had a drone attack of about 40 drones that attacked a, uh, a, a Blue 4 defensive position uh, as they were conducting uh, a defensive operation tied to uh, the Op 4's artillery preparation for that defense. We're also using the EW spectrum to find, fix, and locate the Blue Four uh, throughout the battle space. What we have observed over the last eight or so rotations of doing this is generally by training day three, this organization could come to, uh, can establish about 90% target custody of Blue Four locations. And so this is a real uh, challenge that we're facing every day uh, here at the NTC. And if you come to the NTC, you will absolutely see that. Uh, the second, increasing the effects of enemy fires. We're going after command posts. Last rotation in nine days, we struck 54 command posts uh, during that time, 54 separate attacks. And so we are driving units to find creative ways to make their command posts more survivable. Third, we're bringing the division into the fight. The division is a critical element of the, of the tactical fight and is the, uh, uh, is the decisive uh, element of, the, uh, of tactical maneuver. So we're bringing our divisions in. We just had one AD out in the box. Their division operated in parallel to the BCT in the box. Next, uh, in February, we'll have 3rd ID, the division come out in advance and conduct shaping operations as it prepares its BCT to enter a rotation right behind it. Finally, one of the tenets of uh, multi-domain operations is endurance, and we are working to bring the division in to create that endurance through a much more focused regeneration process that includes an external QAQC. So we're not letting units leave, thanks to uh, General Pappas and the, in the direction he's given from Forces Command, we're not letting a unit leave until they get to 90% operational readiness rate. So we return them back to the force ready to fight. So those are the four main uh, initiatives we're working on at the National Training Center. I'll pass it over to JRTC now. Good morning, everyone. I'm Dave Gardner, and I'm the commanding general down at the Joint Readiness Training Center and uh, Fort Polk. So as Kurt Taylor, my counterpart at the National Training Center mentioned, I say it a little bit differently. When I was a young man, I was made to study a book called America's First Battles. I think the combat training centers were created to be the antidote to those America's First Battles. Much like 80 years ago, Marshall said it, we want the mistakes to be made down in Louisiana or at Hohenfels or at Fort Irwin. We don't want them to be made overseas. So what I'm gonna share with you this morning are just a few things, three of them specifically, that I'm thinking about as I go to sleep at night, wondering how we are going to be the instrument of change for the Chief of Staff and the Force Com Commanding General. The first is the division is now under large-scale combat operations, the principal tactical formation. So how do we do everything in that context? But more importantly, how do we preserve the training audiences intended by each event, whether at home station or at the combat training center, and essentially become experts at multi-echelon training. The second thing is we enhance our learning opportunities is not just becoming experts at multi-echelon training. How do we get better at multi-location training? Leveraging the full spectrum of live, virtual, and constructive operations to link together on vast distances, multiple formations that replicate that core and that division fight. And then the third thing is I think about multi-domain operations at the combat training centers and at Joint Readiness Training Center. How do we model the capabilities that we will experience on the modern battlefield into 2030? And I think of it in two ways, and I try not to be confused by that. How do we first paint the environments? How do we paint the environments of transparent, congested, degraded, denied, 
environments for our soldiers training in that fight. But then secondly, and more importantly, how do we drive the training outcomes that we need? If we put soldiers in an electromagnetic environment where they are denied, they have options to drop down and perhaps do things analog, perhaps go to alternate procedures. But that is just experiencing the environment. We have to pursue the realistic training devices that drive the training outcomes to counter that environment, to fight in that environment, and to succeed on the modern battlefield. Thank you. I look forward to your questions, and I'll be followed by JMRC and 7th ATC, Joe Hilbert. Well, good morning. I'm Joe Hilbert. I command the 7th Army Training Command, and today I'm going to talk to you about what we're doing at, joint, at the Joint Multinational Readiness Center, one of our organizations where we train large-scale combat operations in a European environment. The first thing I'd tell you is you can see, as Kurt alluded to, with what's happened in Nagorno-Karabakh and in Ukraine, Europe is a large-scale combat operations theater. We're watching it unfold every day. And to, uh, here we go. Well, there we go. Uh, how, do we, how do we prepare for it, and how do we do that in a European environment? So unlike the other CTCs, we are our Europe CTC. We're ConPlan informed, and we're ConPlan informing. Right? So we are both looking at the comm plans that we have, and we are, uh, we are informed by them, and then we take the lessons learned. We feed them back up through U.S. Army Europe and Africa uh, to inform uh, comm plan repites. Um, we are Europe CTC, as I mentioned, and then, as everybody said, we know that the principal tactical formation in large-scale combat operations is the division. While our primary training audience remains the brigade combat team, what we've done is, and we've done this for a while, is we'll put a division headquarters on the top of the rotation. That can be a U.S. division, it can be a multinational division, it can be an division. Uh, as an example, recently we had first uh, armored division from uh, Germany as the HICON, and they brought their division operations and intelligence section in, and they were the division fighting the fight. We then put brigades in the constructive fight adjacent to the live brigade. So in that particular rotation, we had a Slovakian brigade in the north and we had a Croatian brigade in the south. That division had command and control of those three brigades plus a uh, Lithuanian brigade, uh, or I'm sorry, a Latvian brigade that was the primary training audience with a U.S. battalion inside it. We provide a constructive division artillery and a constructive combat aviation brigade so that the division can fight all of those elements that they normally have. It is a multinational division, even if it's a U.S. headquarters, we're going to give them a, a NATO order and they're going to be Considered multinational division home tells. Thanks. A little technically challenged there. Um, we've got the complete wrap in there, but at the end of the day, the main focus remains that primary training audience. So the division, the other brigades, they're all secondary training audiences, and it's allowing them to get a good rep in it, as uh, Chuck mentioned. We've got to make use of every training opportunity to train at different echelons concurrently, and that's what we're able to do. The final thing is uh, we are not an agnostic training center, so we are a European training center. We train on European terrain, obviously. Uh, the physical terrain is the terrain of Central Europe, but we create a European operating environment. That includes European interagency partners. So every rotation will have um, folks, we've had folks from uh, the, the Technisches Hilfswerk out of uh, the Federal Republic of Germany, a FEMA-like organization. They'll bring their actual people into the rotation and function in that role in the rotation. We've had Bavarian Red Cross do the same thing. And then most recently, uh, we'll have consular officers from the Department of State will come in and they'll run the, uh, the, they'll run our consulates inside the, uh, inside the training center as we do the fight. So this rotation, we had four consular officers running a uh, consulate in a large-scale combat operation where, where they're able to perform their function uh, in, in a conflict environment. And that is, gonna, that is how we are training large-scale combat operations in Europe. With that, I'll pass off to uh, Scott Woodward from CACT. Good morning. Uh, Colonel Scott Woodward from uh, Combined Arms Center Training. Uh, it's a training aid, training device simulator, simulation in the Army. Uh, we touch it. Uh, so we kind of run, tra we're the training proponent for the Army. Uh, some things we're excited about, you know, 7-0 came out last summer. 7-0 uh, is going to get us back on track. And what we need to do uh, is train training management. Um, so we're working with our professional military education systems, company commander, first sergeant courses, to teach these young leaders how to plan, prepare, execute, and assess training. Uh, something we've got away, away from uh, in the past 15 years. We're really going to focus on getting back on that. Our warfighter program, 
A lot of exciting things about the Warfighter program going forward. Where we used to do uh, multinational warfighters every other year, we're now going to start doing them uh, after the spring every, every year. So multinational, more joint, and we're going to make sure we touch all domains. We just had a really exciting warfighter out in Indo-PACOM uh, with First Corps, one of the new scenarios we built specifically for them. Uh, so we're working on modernizing that program as well. Uh, home station training, uh, looking at upgrading and modernizing our ranges for home station training, uh, building ranges for mobile protective firepower, uh, we're getting ready to design ranges for the next generation squad weapon. And then uh, we've got some exciting things coming with our target tree. Uh, we're using these deployable range packages in Europe right now to support our troops that are deployed over there. Um, and also use with our allies with trackless moving targets. Um, and we're developing uh, for the future here a thing we call multi-spectral target, uh, which has a radar signature, will emit an EW signature, and can replicate multiple thermal signatures so that we can use the same target form to replicate different, different vehicles on the same range. Uh, we're working really closely with uh, synthetic training environment uh, cross-functional team down at Army Futures Command uh, to develop what we're called the synthetic training environment or the STE uh, so that we can have a persistent training environment where soldiers that are training live, virtual, or constructive can all come together and be integrated into one exercise. So uh, real exciting there, but uh, don't forget we're talking about 2030 here and this, this stuff won't be ready tomorrow. And then lastly, uh, you know, Center for Army Lessons Learned uh, falls under us, and right now they've got a huge effort going on to collect observations uh, from the Ukraine and dissem disseminate those out to the force. Uh, thanks for your time, and I'll be followed by uh, General Lombardo. Hey, before I uh, open up for questions, just want to close out. So uh, you just heard from the masters of, of our combat training centers, you know, and in our pursuit of mastery in 2030 from our institutional army, our doctrine, you know, the bottom line, um, we, we do want, we do and we want and need and we're going to get a persistent training environment, you know, and, and, and that is aimed at giving time back to leaders. It's turnkey and it allows training to, you know, occur at all times, whether it's at the institution, home station training, in our rotational forces and at our combat training center program. Lincoln, in a distributed manner, uh, those multi-echelon events will really, I think, enable our leaders to be at the training environment take them out of the data management business and, and really help us pull that line of departure back and, and, and get the most out of our training reps, that fort to port kind of mentality. You know, from the projection of our posts, our garrisons are involved, to the, you know, to the movement, the RSO and I, and to the execution of those, uh, those operations and those company battle tasks and metal tasks. That is what we're trying to do at Home Station, and we are absolutely trying to validate that at our combat training center program and while deployed, maintaining uh, that proficiency uh, to keep our, our forces ready at all times. Uh, with, without further ado, I'll, ta I'll take questions from the field and, and as we uh, orient it uh, to one of our experts, I'll hand it off to them. So any, any questions at this time? Good morning, uh, Todd South, Army Times. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how a rotation in one of the CTCs might look differently for a brigade commander now that division and corps in, are enabled within that construct versus, say, past rotations, which are focused almost solely on the BCT? Uh, great question. Kurt, I'll go ahead and hand it off to you. Yeah, absolutely. So I'll give you a great example. Um, just uh, last month, 1st Armor Division was conducting a constructive exercise uh, adjacent and parallel to 2-1 AD, who's attacking into the box. So we had timed it so that the division's river crossing was coincident with the seizure of the town of Razish. So in a previous rotation, brigade commander says, hey, I don't feel like the conditions are set for me to seize this critical urban objective. I'm going to wait six hours, eight hours until I feel comfortable. What we created in this scenario was the division commander, who coincidentally was his boss, uh, was calling down to the brigade commander saying, hey, when are you going to seize that city because i got to set conditions to cross this river at the same time because we knew it would cause the commitment of the 803rd to protect the, the capital city, which would enable him to get across the river. So we're getting brigade commanders out of their box and thinking as, that they are an integral part of the division's close fight as the primary tactical formation. So that's a, that's a phase shift. When I was a brigade commander at the NTC, they drew me a box, told me to get from one end to the other, and gave me a bunch of resources to do that. We're pulling brigade commanders out of that, and they've got to understand the broader context of the division in which they're fighting. Yeah, and I think what Kurt's also added is now that Devardi commander, that cab commander, the DTAC, can be a part of that training audience. 
you know, up until the last few years, their only reps were in, a, in an MCTP warfighter, which is great, but getting everybody out in the box to understand the science and what it takes to move those larger formations, I think, is also helping. Thanks for the question, Todd. I any other questions? Francois, sir. Yeah, nice to meet you. Uh, French liaison officer to Fort Leavenworth. Uh, you need a new way of managing the talents uh, with modernizing your army. How will uh, the new way of doing training help you shape, find uh, the new talents you are needing? Yes, sir. And it, we could probably, Todd and a couple of us, are, are, Scott can talk about this, but the, the talent management, the training management today and, and the, where we want to go, we think directly uh, enforces the talent management of the 21st century as the, as the chief talks about it quite a bit. And I think Tom Felty's uh, points could uh, lay that out as we're looking at his progressions. Thanks, Chuck. And uh, just uh, thanks for the question, great question, because, because as, as our you know, chief says, people are everything for us. And getting that right, those right people selected early as lieutenants matter. And so right now, in our, in our branches right now, we have uh, something called uh, you know, talent-based branching. And so as the branch chief for armor, we lay out the, you know, the knowledge, skills, and behaviors of the officers we're looking for, and we get to vote on every single cadet in the Army. And so there's a little bit of a match. You have an officer that shows interest in, in your branch, but then there's also certain things that we're looking for uh, in those officers that we know that it's kind of like lead indicators that they're going to be successful in our branch. And so those are, you know, those are some of the ways of going very deep in the, into the cadet pool to make sure that we're assessing the, uh, the right officers. Now, as we go towards Army of 2030 and beyond, in fact, just uh, a couple of weeks ago at the Combined Arms Center, uh, led by the Mission Command Center of Excellence, we were looking what what are those 2030 and 24 uh, 2040 uh, knowledge skills and attributes and behaviors that we're going to need within our branch to make sure that we know what they are so we can assess in time for those uh, for those officers thank you yeah. yes sir join Hey, what's going on, sir? Jordan Lewiston. Um, so, uh, as you're kind of working toward, uh, you know, kind of the, this persistent training environment, uh, what data challenges are you seeing with respect to data generation, uh, aggregation, visualization, and, and, and how, how you're doing that in tighter time cycles to give more near real-time feedback to units, as well as to uh, accurately represent like units in the constructive domain? Well, I know we got, we got the, the great William Glazer here for the synthetic training environment. I, I don't know if they're challenges, it's just really the priorities of how we're tackling this. I know we're working on, you know, where we adjudicate, you know, data, the, you know, the tactical computing at the edge, you know, in the training environment. But then I think as Tom has talked about and, and some of our other folks, the, the capturing of that training event, is, you know, and the training, the training rep custody a, a, along the continuum is the other piece that the training management tools will, will package and, and pick up the, from the STE. So those training events will be captured and then passed along into the, the, the legacy systems or DTMS or eventually into ATIS to form that more of a three-dimensional training record, uh, you know, for the training at large. Now, the local, you know, actions on the objective and all those trainings, I think we're working through that right now. And, and, and you know, Will, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I think we have options that we're working through and, and we're in soldier touch points right now to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. I think we have time for one more question. Hey, look, thank you all. We'll, we'll uh, end where we began by thanking you all for coming. I know this is a very passionate subject for all of us. It's our golf game, if you will. But, so thanks to uh, give a round of applause to this incredible uh, cadre of folks that have laid this out for us. Thank you very much. Have a great day.